Our message today marks an important point in this series of meetings. Really, there's only one subject that fits the need, that we should, at this juncture, we should talk about his cross and the glory of it. It's wrong for a minister to speak about the love of God as revealed in the cross without asking that everyone who hears respond to that love. To fail to respond is fatal. The only thing that God cannot forgive is that he gives us his love and we refuse to respond. That is the unpardonable sin. Now there are three groups in our service today to whom I would like to speak in a special way. There are those of you who have never told the Lord that you love him. I'm going to invite you to tell him today. Perhaps not with your lips, but with your feet. I'm going to invite those of you who would like to tell the Lord that you love him, that you have never done it before, but that as a result of a moving of the Spirit of God in your, hearts, your heart and a conviction that is there, that is stronger than you have ever known in your life. It's only safe and wise and right that we respond to that love that is appealing to our lives and to our hearts and that we tell the Lord we love him. Now there's a second group, and that is those of you who once loved him and your love has grown cold. You have given your loyalty, your affection, your time, your attention to something or someone else. And that someone else is not half as deserving or even a tenth or a tithe or any percentage as deserving as the love that you owe to the Lord of Calvary about whom we speak today. You lost your love, and yet you felt in your heart that love reviving. There's only one thing to do, is to let that love burst forth again in your life. You've got to do it sometime. You've been telling yourself that you're going to do it. There's no better time than now. Then there are those of you who have loved him. You've loved the Lord, and yet you're loving him more as a result of seeing the glory of his truth, and that you want to draw closer to him. And you must let that love that the Lord is revealing to you in his truth, you must let it deepen. Because unless love deepens, then it dies. So I'm going to ask you all to come to Calvary at this evening hour, because that's the place that he's waiting for us. I had someone say to me, Mr. Hoffman, do you think that this is, uh, that this is your greatest sermon? You said it's your favorite sermon. Is it your greatest sermon? Well, I don't think of it that way. I think of it in these terms, that this is the greatest theme on which the human mind can dwell. There is no greater subject that a minister can discuss with the congregation than the cross of our Lord. And yet I never approach this subject of the cross of Jesus, his crucifixion, without a great sense of my own human inadequacy. It falls like a depression upon my heart, upon my mind. Who is equal to these things in the word of Scripture? Yet today we're going to attempt and I say attempt advisedly, to see the Lord crucified. We're going to go back 2,000 years. We're going to go to Calvary. We're going to attempt to see what was going on there. And yet who? Who is equal to this? Who is able to understand it? Who is able to grasp with his mind and his soul? The theme is just, just too great for any man. And yet... We've got to venture forward, not because we're adequate or equal to it, 
but because God has said that we are to look and we are to live. And because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I feel a special need in my heart for the presence of the Lord in this afternoon hour. And I'm going to ask you now for just a moment to bow your head with me. And I'm going to ask you to lift your hearts, lift your request to God, that he'll be here in a very special and precious way. Shall we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, we come today, this hour, to walk on the sacred ground, the sacred ground of Calvary, ground made sacred by his holy blood. We're going to attempt, dear Lord, to understand your Son and what he did there for us, an understanding that we might have our affection, our love, our commitment to him made more deep. Lord, we don't know how to do this, any of us. We don't know how to lift our hearts. We surely don't know how to lift our voices. But, Lord, we all have needs, needs that can only be satisfied disturbances and agitation in our lives that can only be put to rest as he satisfies those needs with his own presence. So in our need we plead that your spirit will be here in a very precious way with each one of us. Knowing your love, dear Father, we know that you are not disappoint us. Because we ask in the name of Jesus, your Son, our precious Lord. Amen. I'm going to read a text here from the Gospel of Luke. Just one single verse, mind you. In verse 33 of chapter 23, you won't need to open your Bible. You can remember it as soon as I read it. And when they were come to a place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. It's an amazing thing to notice that the story of the crucifixion of Jesus is told here in a single verse. There is not the slightest attempt on the part of the gospel writer to be dramatic. There are no grim or ghastly details. There is not any attempt to make a horror story out of it. There is no attempt to play on the emotions. In a single verse, they took him to a place called Calvary. They crucified him there. There was a thief on the right and a thief on the left. It would be very difficult to imagine a greater economy of words. Now I'm going to tell you something that sounds astonishing at first glance. But the Christian church is now almost crowding 2,000 years old. And the central theme of the gospel is the cross of Christ. And yet, after 2,000 years, it is an astonishing thing for me to say that I find very, very few people, pitifully few, one here, one there, who really understands what happened. Probably the best known fact in the Christian faith is that Jesus was crucified. And on the, other, on the other hand, it is probably one of the least understood after all of these centuries of time. The average person in the world thinks that Jesus was a very good man. No question about his being a good man. But he was very shabbily treated, and he was killed. Or perhaps they go a little further than that and say that he was a fellow, a man of great convictions, who believed so strongly 
in what he taught that he would rather die than say he didn't believe it. In other words, that he's not just a, a good man who got a bad deal, but a man with great convictions and therefore a moral man. Or we might even make it a little stronger than that. That there are some people who see in the Lord Jesus a person who not only would not sell out at any price, but that he was a great moral hero. And he established at Calvary some kind of an example by which he might let us know how that we too, if needful, that we ought to die triumphant over our enemies. But is that really all that happened? at Calvary? Was Calvary only a moral drama to teach good people how to die? Beyond that, it is a strange thing, but true, that there are many folk who, reading the biblical record, or who have had it impressed upon their mind through motion pictures or what have you, that have seen at Calvary very little beyond uh, that which is physical what can be seen with the human eyeball. Many have not understood anything except the physical violence. And there has been, have been efforts to play upon the emotions by stressing the violence that was done there. Now please don't misunderstand me. The pain that our Lord endured in his body is not to be minimized, and I would not in any sense detract or cause a diminution of the concept that our Lord in his body gave himself his body. But we have to see, if we're really going to understand the events of Calvary, we're going to have to see underneath this physical violence, and we're going to have to see that really the redemptive action of the Lord Jesus was a highly spiritual one. That the redemptive act could really not in fullness be seen with the normal eye. After all, thousands of people were crucified in the same manner, physically. But that it is underneath, it is a spiritual understanding where the redemption occurs. And that if we today can understand the, the spiritual, then we are able thereby to make a spiritual commitment that is, while it is a very faint carbon copy of his, yet that commitment must be made. And we learn how to make our commitment by seeing the spiritual commitment of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the depth, the depth of our spiritual commitment is in proportion to what we see him doing. And it is with that objective that I want to invite you this afternoon to take another look at Calvary. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, the Apostle Paul makes uh, just an astonishing statement. And yet it's one of those passages of Scripture that you read at the end of the day just before you drop into sleep and you don't even know what you've read. But this is a colossal statement. It must be read in the early morning. You know, we give our Lord the, the dregs of the day at the end. when We ought to give him the best of the day at the beginning. Now Paul says here, and this is a complicated passage, but I'm going to try to underscore it a bit so that you can grasp what he's saying. It's our purpose, our business, he said, to make all men understand the fellowship of the mystery. A mystery is something difficult to understand or sometimes impossible. But we enter into the fellowship. You notice fellowship? That means he did it. We are to do it, and in that we enter into a fellowship, a similar experience together. 
to make all men understand the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid or hidden. It's been hidden. We haven't been able to see it. We haven't been able to understand it. Has been hidden in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the purpose that now unto the principalities in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You see how wise God is in this act that he hid, this mystery, this fellowship, according to. Now here is, as they say in today's world, the punchline of the passage. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. An eternal purpose. Now you say, Brother Hoffman, you lost me way back there. I don't even know what you're talking about. All right, I'm going to try to find you again. Here it is. In the beginning of the world, and even before, from the beginning of the world, Paul says, before the world was ever made, there was an agreement between the Father and the Son that in the event that this world would fall into the disaster of sin, that the Son of God would come to this world and make a sacrifice for its redemption. God didn't announce that he had made this agreement with his Son, because if he had, it would have only stimulated curiosity. He kept it a secret, he kept it hidden, until it was necessary to tell what he was going to do. God intended that his son should make a sacrifice, the eternal purpose. But now I'm going to shock you. While it is true that God intended for his son to make a sacrifice, God never intended that his son should be crucified. Let me say that again, because if you don't get that one, if you don't understand that sentence right there, then we're going on for talk for the next half hour and you won't even know what I'm talking about. God intended for his son to make a sacrifice. But God never, never, never intended for his son to be crucified. A sacrifice? Yes. A crucifixion? No. Categorically? Categorically, no. Now you may wonder, that's a strong statement, isn't it? But I'm going to ask a few questions here. The crucifixion was a crime against an innocent man. Did God plan for a crime? Did he? Did he plan a crime? The crucifixion was a horrible violation of justice against an innocent man. Would a just God plan and help to perpetrate an unjust action against a man who was innocent? Would he do that? Now you see, this brings up a question, doesn't it? as to the honorability of God, as to the justice of God, as to whether God played games or needed criminals to help him. Now there are a few questions. There would never have been a crucifixion if the people whom God had chosen had accepted him. In order to have a crucifixion required a rejection. Now, did God plan for the Jewish people to reject his son? Is God a hypocrite, after all, that he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and he doesn't want them to come at all secretly in his heart of hearts? He talks with his mouth one thing and says, Come, and then he says, No, don't do it, because I want you to reject my son in order that you'll hate him enough to crucify him? Does God talk out of both sides of his mouth? What about that? 
if God planned a crucifixion, a criminal action. What about Judas Iscariot? Do we owe something to Judas? What if Judas had been converted and he had not done this dastardly deed? Did God need the help of a man who had no principles? A man who would sell out his friend for 30 pieces of silver? Did God need the help of this kind of character? Was God manipulating Judas Iscariot like a marionette on a string? What about that one? In order to have the crucifixion, you have to have a betrayal. Was God manipulating Judas so he'd do this thing? You see the question. What about Pontius Pilate? What if Pontius Pilate had been a man of principle and who had said, under no circumstances will I, as a representative, as the procurator of the Roman Empire, will I do this crime against an innocent man? He's free as far as I'm concerned. What if he had been a man instead of a mouse? What if he'd had a backbone instead of a wishbone? Do we need, did God need, a poor, weak, vacillating, pusillanimous pilot? in order to work out the redemption of the human family? Did God have to employ this character of people to work his will? Did God need the help of murderers to find his way into human hearts? These are questions that if you haven't thought about them, you probably have. And some of you may have thought about them and you swept them under the carpet because they were so frightening to you to even think about them. But they won't go away. They just won't go away because we ignore them. But all of these questions that I have brought up here are, are basic to understanding, really, to really understanding what happened at Calvary. Now, what is the source? What is the source of this confusion? The source of the confusion is like this that for 2,000 years we have failed to distinguish between two things. They were both happening at the same time. They were both happening with the same man at the center. And they were both happening at the same place called Calvary. And yet the moral values between these two separate actions are so different is that there's no way in the world are they the same thing. There was a visible action, a horrible crime, the tragedy of the crucifixion, the visible execution of the Son of God. That's one thing was happening. But at the same time, that was a visible action. At the same time, there was his glorious cross. This was an invisible and spiritual work. The self-sacrifice of the Lord Jesus on your behalf and mine. And that was going on inside our Lord. This you can never penetrate with the eyeball. It has to be understood with the heart. So that there are two entirely different sets of relationships. I'm going to go a step further to make a series of comparisons that I hope will be clear enough that you'll never confuse these two things again. I'm going to say that my right hand is the crucifixion. This is what men were doing. And that my left hand is the cross, what God was doing. Now, the crucifixion reveals the hate of man for God. But the cross shows the love of God for man. The crucifixion is man at his worst. But the cross is God at his best. The crucifixion is the attitude of man toward God. While the cross is the attitude of God toward man. The crucifixion is man at his lowest, and the cross is God at his highest. The crucifixion is the folly of the world, 
But the cross, Paul said, is the wisdom of God. The crucifixion is what man was doing to God. But the cross is what God was doing for man. The crucifixion is man taking the life of God. But the cross is God giving his life for man. Finally, the crucifixion is the greatest criminal action of all time. But the cross is the most sublime moral action that our universe will ever see. And yet, if I were to say it briefly, the supreme criminality of man and the sublime morality of God find their focal point at one concentrated place called Calvary at the same time on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock at the same hour 2,000 years ago. Listen now to this next sentence because it is vital to the comprehension of the entire message the cross. We are not redeemed underscore we're not redeemed by what man was doing. We're not redeemed by the crucifixion. We are redeemed by what God was doing. We are redeemed by the cross. We're not redeemed by what men were doing to him. Men drove the nails. Men blasphemed. Men made for him a crown of thorns and a purple robe. We're not redeemed by what men did at Calvary. We're redeemed by what he did at Calvary. In a sense, with this afternoon, we're going to try to dispel the rabble and the mob and quiet them all down and just look at our Lord and watch him work and see the redemption of our God. Now let's take a closer look at these two separate events that I have tried to illustrate. Let's look at the nature of the crucifixion. Not in its gruesome details, but what was really, really, truly underneath this violence. What was it truly involved? I'm going to astonish you by saying that all during the ministry of the Lord Jesus... He was tempted by the devil. It began from the very beginning. It was intensified in 40 days in the wilderness, but it never let up. Not as long as he was breathing, it never let up. The final thrust of temptation of the adversary of your soul and mine and him, the final thrust of temptation was made at Calvary. A powerful temptation. You say, I don't understand that. We're going to attempt to read from the Bible how this is true. Remember that the crucifixion didn't catch our Lord by surprise. All the time, if you read especially in John's Gospel, all the time he was talking about an hour that had not yet come. He said, this is your hour and the power of darkness when they bound him in the garden. He said to Pontius Pilate, for this cause came I into the world. The cross did not catch our Lord by surprise from the time that he was twelve when he saw a quivering lamb upon the altar at the time of his first visit to the temple. He knew why he was come here that he had come here in order to die. Now what happened at the cross? The devil made his last great effort at the cross to dissuade him, to tempt him to abandon the whole purpose of his mission. You see that at least five times and perhaps more, but I call your attention to five. In Mark 15 and 29, the crowd said to him, save thyself and come down from the cross. 
There was a temptation there. What are you doing upon that cross with all this power of yours, with which you can stop the waves from, from moving and speak to the wind? What are you doing here? You've got the power to come down and save yourself. A temptation? Of course, he had the power. The rulers said to him in Mark 15, 31 and 2, he saved others himself he cannot save. Oh, yes, he could. There's a song that says he could have called 10,000 angels. It wasn't a question that he could not, he must not. Himself, he must not save. And so they jeered at him. You can save others, but you can't save yourself. You are an imposter. The soldiers said to him in Luke 23 and 37, If thou art a king, if you are a king, save yourself. And the thief on the left said to Jesus in Luke 23 and 39, Art thou not the Christ? Save thyself and us. Temptation? Of course. The devil's temptation. And even the superstitious were there in Mark 15 and 37 or 36 when Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the ignorant and the superstitious or were there. And they thought that he had cried for Elijah to come and save him. And so they said, oh, let's wait a minute. Don't rush away now. Let's stay and see if Elijah is going to come and save him. A temptation? Sure. Why? The devil said, look, these people don't love you. They don't love you. They don't want any part of you. They're jeering and laughing at you. You've not had any success. Where are your 5,000 now that you fed? What a pitiful result you've had. You don't need to go through this. Come on down now. That's what he must not do. And that decision was made in your Lord's heart and mine, that he wouldn't come down. He wouldn't. Even those that his disciples, those that were there, remember there was John there. John was there, one man out of the twelve, and three women by the name of Mary. What a success story he had going. Mary Magdalene, Mary his mother, and Mary the mother of James and Salome. What a success story. They didn't understand what was going on. If those disciples could have prevented the tragedy, they certainly would have prevented his death if they could. All that they saw, really, at Calvary was the tragedy of the crucifixion. As far as they were concerned, it was the end of everything that they had hoped for. But... There's something beautiful here, too. There was one man at Calvary who understood what was going on, and only one. And that was the thief. Do you remember what happened that that thief on the right he was the only one who saw it? And he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord. He said, what? He said, Lord. This was no mockery. This was no, if you are the Lord. He said, Lord. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. This one man saw that at Calvary was not the end of everything. It was only the beginning. This one man saw indeed that Jesus was a king. And he saw beyond the apparent defeat of Calvary, he could see a kingdom. This one man with spiritual vision that transcended the apparent defeat, this one man could see that Jesus 
was laying the foundation of a spiritual kingdom. He alone, the whole crowd, saw that Jesus must not come down. So what was the crucifixion? The crucifixion was a devilish scheme to break the will of the Son of God. These people don't love you. They hate you. Nobody understands. What are you doing here? Let them duck away and leave them. They deserve nothing. Now I must say this. That what they did to him, to his body, there's not the slightest question that what they did to him made what he was doing for them more difficult. But may I reassert that we are not saved by what they did to him. We are saved by what he was doing for them, and for you and me. We are not saved by the crucifixion. That's what men did. We're saved by the cross. That's what he did. Now, we've looked at the crucifixion, and now I'd like you to look at the cross. And here again is one of those sentences that you must not lose out on if you do, then you won't understand anything for the next ten minutes. The shocking truth comes through as you read the Gospels that the death of Jesus was not the result of the crucifixion. I'm going to say it again to be sure that you got it. The death of our Lord had nothing to do with the crucifixion. There were three men who ultimately died at Calvary. Only two of them were killed. Uh, two thieves. Two men died as a result of the crucifixion. Two thieves, but not the Lord. Now you say, now you have shocked us. But why should you be shocked, really now, when the scripture is so clear on this matter? And it's all written out here in our Lord's own words from the 10th chapter of John. And when I read it to you, you'll, be, you'll feel a little bit maybe silly inside that it was there all the time. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd, what does a good shepherd do? He gives his life. He gives it. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Now I'm going to underscore this real strong. No man takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. How could he say it more plainly? No man takes my life. Those who crucified him did not take the life of Jesus. He said, I'm going to lay it down myself. No man takes it from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. You see, we must never think of our Lord totally as a man like ourselves. Because he wasn't. His birth was different from every other birth ever born. His life was different from every other life ever lived. And his death was different from any other death ever died. He was totally different. Different in his birth, different in his life, different in his death. He said, I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. You and I don't have either one. We cannot of our own volition. We have no such capability of our own volition to lay down our lives. 
And certainly we have no, no power once we lay it down take it up again. We have such power. Jesus said, I have the power. Why did he have it? He had it simply because it was by his own sovereign choice that the agreement between the Father and the Son in the very beginning, that he had agreed by his own sovereign will that he would come into the world and he would take upon himself a human nature in order that he might live among men and that men might behold in him the only begotten of the Father and they might behold his glory. A glory, it is true, that is veiled in human flesh. Nevertheless, the glory of God is his self-sacrificing love. That's his glory. Inasmuch as our Lord took upon himself a human nature by his own will, he could by that same sovereign will, he could lay it down at any time. Because his will was always sovereign. Now you say, well, Brother Hoffman, you say here that the Lord said, I lay down my life, no man takes it from me. Is there further documentation on this? Yes, there's ample documentation. When you take, for example, in Matthew 27 and 46, Jesus cried out on the cross. The scripture says that he said with a loud voice, and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the scripture records that he did it with a loud voice. What does that show to you and me today? It shows that in no sense was he physically exhausted by ordeal through which he was passing. He was possessed of a full physical power. It takes a lot of strength just without this. I have been in the court ministry, I've been to the bedside of many a person who was dying, and I have leaned over the bed. The hands were pale, lips were pale, and I have spoken to the person and I've spoken their name, and they have opened their eyes and turned their head with great effort and looked at me. And then I see their lips move and a little bit of breath coming. And in order to attempt to listen to what this individual, this saint of God, is trying to tell me, I lean over the bed and I cup my hand behind my ear and I listen for all I'm worth and I... I can't understand, and so I hold their hand in mine between my hands, and, and I let them know that I understand, and I know that they can hear, because the hearing goes on when the breath is gone, or almost gone. So that the absence of the power to speak shows that the physical powers are debilitated and absent. But when our Lord was upon the cross, he cried with a loud voice. And that shows that he was not dying from physical causes. And then again, if you notice in verse 50 of Matthew 27, the scripture says, And when he had cried again with a loud voice, that he gave up the ghost, which means he died. In other words, the speaking of our Lord with a loud voice and his dying are right tightly linked together in Matthew 27 and 50, which shows that to the very moment that he died, that he still had his full physical power. Why was it, when Matthew wrote his gospel, that the Holy Spirit put his hand on Matthew's shoulder and said, don't forget, Matthew, to tell the folks that... My son spoke with a loud voice to the very end. And the reason is that he wanted to let us know he was not dying for physical reasons, but by his own. There's another little thing that is very precious here in the gospel. In the gospel of John says that he bowed his head and he died. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that just a bit information? And some of you may say, 
I don't understand. Oh, what do you mean? He says he bowed his head and died. Does he rush about this? Necessarily. You don't? Don't you see that that is exactly backward normal? That a man dies and then his head drops. But this is the other way. He bowed his head and he died. Which tells us very simply that our Lord consciously, rently, of his own volition, he lowered his head upon his own breast, and then he died. Lord, a fool savior. He's not like so many times you see on crucifixes. On crucifixes, it wasn't that way. Our Lord's head was up. His head was up. The Holy Spirit in Scripture tells us his head was up till the moment he died. He was no swooning Christ. It shows that he had power to hold up his head. So he consciously lowered his head and he died. And then, read from the Scripture how that he said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. You notice, Father, I commend my spirit, that his was not a life that was taken. It was a life that was given. And we must understand that. It is for this reason, you see, that because he gave of his own will, he surrendered his life. That's why he has a right to ask you and me to surrender our lives. He does not ask of you and me to do anything that he himself did not do. Therefore, my friends, he has a claim upon you. A claim that is absolute. A claim that is substantiated and made total by the fact that Calvary's Hill, our Lord died of his own sovereign decision and that's why he has the right to ask you and me to make a decision to give him our lives because he gave his life for us now I brought up a bunch of questions in the beginning and I'm going to attempt briefly to answer them did God need Pilate to be a weakling? Did God need an infamous character like Judas to sell out? Did God need that the people should reject him in order to crucify him, otherwise the whole plan of salvation would be sent askew? What if, let's suppose, what if the people on that week, the Passion Week we call it, had all fallen at his feet, including the established church of that day, if they had fallen at his feet and accepted him, then what? What if Judas had been converted? What if Pilate had been a man of principle? Then what? He would have died at exactly the same time on the same day. He would have given his life the violence, the criminality, the brutality of the crucifixion was not necessary to redeem the human family. What was necessary was the willingness, the spiritual work that was worked in the heart of our Lord, that was not visible to the human eye. It's that invisible thing that we're trying to penetrate, the smoke screen. We're trying to penetrate this smoke screen of violence so that we can see what, what really happened there. You see, the devil has put this smoke screen for 2,000 years around the cross for one purpose, and that is to obscure what our Lord did there for you and me. What a story. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now I'm going to draw the line and I'm going to give you just a little more 
as we look at the cross this one last time. The cross is a strange paradox, and this paradox is just beyond comprehension, really. Do you realize that the cross is an expression of hatred? The, law, the cross of our Lord is an expression of hatred. Because Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What's God saying there at Calvary? He was saying, I hate sin so much that if my own son is involved in it, I will turn my back upon him. You want to know how much God hates sin? You see that at Calvary. When the Father turned his back upon his only begotten Son. Some people think that only the Son suffered there. But pain for pain the Father suffered. It pained him so much to turn his back upon his Son in the hour of his greatest need. What pain God endured. But he said, if my son is involved with sin, I cannot look upon him. Oh, true, that Jesus was not a sinner. He had no sin in him, but he had sin on him. He bore our sins, his own body, on the tree. But at the same time, not only is the cross the ultimate statement of the hatred of God for sin, it is the ultimate expression of the love of God at the same time. At the cross, God in his Son was reconciling the world unto himself. But from that cross, our Lord was saying, no matter what you do to me, you can hate for me, you can hate me, you can plant for me a crown of thorns, you can make fun of me, you can jeer at me, you can laugh at me, you can bring me down here and nail me to this cross, but nothing that you do to me can make you hate you. Because I love you, I love you, I love you this much. The cross was a statement of the hatred of God for sin. But the cross was a statement of the love of God for sinners. I love you that much. It's for that reason, my friend, when somebody comes to me with a story that the Bible is just another book and that the crucifixion of the Lord is intended to arouse us emotionally and play upon our feelings, I cannot accept this. The cross of Christ is so utterly complex. A statement of hate, at the same time a statement of ultimate love. And it's all blended in a single action around a single man. There is no fiction writer in the world that could invent such a story. Only God could invent a cross. What does it mean to come to the cross? You know, we sing a song, At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, the burden of my heart rolled away. What does it mean to the cross? Let me tell you. What you do when you come to the cross? That you stand beside the Father, and you say, Father, I too turn my back on sin. I will turn my back on sin just like you do here. I agree with you. Sin is something despicable. Sin is something that we must turn our backs upon because it is destructive and the evidence of the destructiveness of sin is found at Calvary. So you join at the side of the Father and you turn your back upon sin and this is no emotional binge. And you come to Calvary and you hear the Lord there and you watch him there demonstrate his love and you say, Lord, Lord, I love you too. The love you give me, I give back to you. Lord, you've given yourself for me. Take me too. I give myself to you. Lord, 
I love you. I love you very much. And this love is real. It's not a transitory thing that happens sometimes when you hear the preacher preach. This love for God is based upon respect and admiration for what he did there, what he did beyond our understanding. And so tonight, I'm inviting you back to Calvary. I'm going to invite you to put aside the crowd, to silence the rabble, to look into the face of Jesus. He's asking for you. And he's saying, I'm giving myself. I want you to give yourself for me. And as you do, you give yourself to him, and you stand beside the Father, and whatever sins may be in your life that you're willing with your heart of hearts to turn your back upon them, then and only then have you been to Calvary and understood the meaning for us today. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, all of our efforts to understand what your Son did are so inadequate. We can't understand, but, O oh Lord, help us, please, to understand his marvelous love, his marvelous sacrifice. Help those, dear God, who have been coming to these meetings now, these four weeks, as they have learned truth from your book, and Jesus is the truth. Help them, Lord. Give them strength to know how to give themselves to you. Some of them giving themselves for the first time. Some of them, their love has grown cold, and they want to, re, to rekindle that love. And some want to deepen it by another commitment. Having seen truth they never saw before and seeing the claim of Jesus on their lives, they feel they can do nothing less. They can do nothing more. Give them courage, Lord, beyond themselves. While your heads are bowed for just a moment, in just a minute, I'm going to ask the organist to play softly. Some of you may feel, while you have your heads bowed and your eyes closed, some of you may feel, well, Brother Hoffman, you just don't understand the circumstances of my life. I can't. I just can't. I can't give my life to Christ. There's this or that or other problems. But you worry about those problems. You come... In the words of that song, it says, just as I am, without one plea, you come just as you are. The Lord knows your problem. If you try to resolve these problems all by yourself, you'll never make it. The enemy of your soul is bigger than you are. He'll create more problems for you and more and more. You'll never get to the end of them. There's only one way to resolve a problem, and that's come and let Jesus do it. But you can't do it unless you yoke up with him. Let him bear your burden. That's why he said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You may say, Brother Hoffman, I can't, I can't under these circumstances. I just can't. Now look, if he could do what he did under the circumstances in which he did it, then you don't have any problems. His circumstances were far more difficult than yours or mine. If he could do what he did under his circumstances, you can give your life to him under any circumstance. He won't accept. He, won't upset, uh, he just won't accept any kind of refusal based on circumstances. He wants to take those circumstances and turn them around. He wants to make them beautiful. He wants to dispel them with just a wave of a nail-pierced hand. And he can do it if you let him. I'm going to ask you now to tell the Lord you love him. Those of you who have never done it, those of you who have grown cold, and those of you in a special way who have learned truth during these last nights together here, 
If you want to accept that truth that you found, you'll never find anything like it in the world. It isn't anywhere else. You won't find anywhere else. It's here. It's alone. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Take this love of ours, which is so small oftentimes because the world is so ever much with us. And Lord, take away our love for the things that are here today and gone tomorrow and they're soon over in the corner. Things that we find don't bring us happiness or peace or lasting satisfaction. But help us, dear God, to find a, a sweet and strong and abiding love for your Son. For we recognize that this in all the days of our lives when that last day may come, that this in finality is all that really matters. And so, Lord, accept this dedication we've made. Come thou into our lives. Make us willing to be made willing. Open the door of hearts, Lord, as we endeavor to open them a little bit. Finish opening them, please. Come thou in and sup with us and honor us with your presence. And fit us for the day when the King of Love shall come, that we may be amongst his children, to honor him, to thank him, to glorify him forever and forever and forever. Thank you, Lord, for your presence today again. Bless those that have come forward that are making a new beginning, that are making a start, that are deepening their commitment. Thank you for them all. And, oh God, please bind them about with the Holy Spirit. Prevent, O oh Lord, the enemy ever moving in on them. Give them special protection, for we know the enemy of our souls is not pleased with what's happened here today. But I pray that you bind them all so very close to yourself. Keep us, dear Lord, for we cannot keep ourselves. And in your kingdom, we'll honor you and praise you forever. Thank you for it all, Lord. And add the things that we don't know how to pray for, but we still have need because of your love in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen.